So why she drop him off? Hmm? Why did the mother feel comfortable leaving her 12 year old son with her father? I waited the entirety of this movie just to hear the mom explain why she felt okay with leaving her son with her father for a Red Hook summer. Huh? They, they, they didn't tell us. <laughs> they didn't tell us. She didn't say nothing. It just, it just went off. <laughs> okay. Hey guys welcome back to my channel it's tyra here with another struggle review here to discuss red hook summer now this was my first time ever in life watching this movie it's from 2012 and it stars clark peters now before we get into all things using religion as a vehicle to be a sexual deviant I need you guys to drop down <laughs> and subscribe to my channel and like this video i'm going to give you guys a moment to do that then we're going to come back and discuss you know, us real Spike Lee fans out there, there comes a time when we have to admit that, you know, he dropped the ball a couple of times. You know, everything isn't gonna be gold. Everything isn't gonna be a masterpiece. This, this here <laughs> was definitely one of those times. Go back, 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 back. You guys have hopefully subscribed to see more of me let's get into this movie but before we jump into the video i have to give a shout out to the person who paid for and requested it so if you happen to walk out of the house of the lord and never want to return it's not because of me <laughs> it's because of this person right here thank you so much for supporting me and paying for this content getting into the movie it was directed and produced by spike lee as well as co-written by him with help from james mcbride with a few of the themes here reflecting his everyday life, growing up in a Red Hood project, as well as having a reverend for a father. This was their second time collaborating with one another after working together years prior on Miracle at St. Anne's, which James McBride also wrote. Now this was Spike Lee's sixth installment into his Chronicles of Brooklyn film series, which includes movies like Clockers, Crooklyn, She's Gotta Have It, Do the Right Thing, and He Got Game. All <laughs> superior films to this one. Now me just recently deciding to watch this film in full now was not at all by accident. This was a movie I intentionally looked over because I did not feel like there would be anything there. Now don't mistake it, a subpar film for Spike Lee is still better than most directors on their best day because he is just that talented. But I am a fan that is guilty of sticking to the oldies, the movies that I love. Your Jungle Fevers, Malcolm X, School Days. I will re-watch the movies he made from 86 to 2000 repeatedly. Even though many feel with Spike Lee's career there was a disconnect and maybe him losing his footing with the movies of Crooklyn and Girl 6, argue with your mama, absolutely not. <laughs> Troy Boy and Judy Lovely will always have a special place in my heart. For me, it happened somewhere around those later 2000s, really after we got the film Summer of Sam. It just feels like every single film moving forward was always an up and down, even though we got something like 25th Hour, Bamboozled and Inside Man, we also got She Hate Me, The Sweet Blood of Jesus, Chirac, in this film right here. And much later getting a return of gold with movies like Black Klansmen and The Five Bloods. Now, Chirac, The Sweet Blood of Jesus were all tinged, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> but Red Hook Summer took the cake for me by far as Spike Lee's worst film. Please drop down and tell me if you feel the same. 
Now to give Spike Lee some credit, cause you know I gotta give him some credit. <laughs> I do understand what he was trying to do here with this movie. Not so much the message in the writing child, we're gonna get to that, but just a return to form for him with the movies he did early on in his career. The independent, low budget, guerrilla style filming, limited locations, equipment, crew, and resources. You know, rushing to shoot on certain filming locations because you don't have the proper permits to shoot there because you don't have enough money. A return to his she's gotta have it days. He paid for this film completely solo dolo out of his own pocket. Meant to look independent, gritty, raw, and unfiltered. This movie is about the actors and the message. Only problem is, some of the actors weren't all that great and the message <laughs> wasn't all that clear. Now we open the movie with mother Colleen who resides in Atlanta dropping her son Flick off in a Red Hook Brooklyn project to spend some time during the summer with his grandfather the good bishop. Though Flick has never in his life met his grandfather prior to this moment, he doesn't want to be there at all and it is hurting her clearly to leave her son there. Now why? <laughs> After watching the movie, it's just kind of like, were you just hurting to leave your son there because you know, oh my baby, I love him. I'm gonna be without him for, for summer or were you concerned for other reasons? I don't know, cause you didn't tell us nothing. Now right off the bat, there is a strong disconnect with grandfather, the good Bishop and his grandson Flick, AKA Silas. They do not agree or see eye to eye on anything. Flick is hella opinionated, often rude, obsessed with his iPad to the point that it is permanently attached to his hand. He is constantly filming everything and everyone. A vegan and doesn't share an ounce of his grandfather's intrusive love for God, church, and religion. Leaving a belief in generational disconnect. Now the good bishop on the other hand, portrayed by Clark Peters here, who is exceptional in this movie. A very, very dynamic actor. There's a lot of force with him, even though he is mostly known for The Wire, Treme, The Corner, <laughs> you know, all of the hood projects. He has a really, really intense background in theater, you know, musicals. So he's a very talented man. The good bishop is covering everything in religion. Not one piece of his apartment is not covered in a cross or a photo of Jesus. Though he appears to welcome his grandson with open arms and wants to make up for lost time, he is also using religion as a vehicle to do that. To the point that you go, well, damn, is the boy on punishment? What did the boy do wrong? <laughs> it is almost like his mother sent him there with the intent of him learning something about himself or learning a lesson. As soon as he arrives, he is, you know, conflicted. Why is there a white photo of Jesus? Isn't Jesus black? Well, how do you know? Always questioning everything. In turn, you have the good bishop go, you are just like your mother. High key, his mother knew exactly who she was sending him to, what her father would be doing and how he would be treating his grandson for the entirety of the summer. And I think we get clarity on that with the one Skype call that we get from her in the movie after we had not seen our own father in 13 years and didn't bother to really say too much of anything to him when we arrived. We never hear the mother say, tell your grandfather I said hello, let me speak to your grandfather. Hey, tell your grandfather I love him. It was never that type of energy. Yet and still, we sent our son there to learn something from this man. Now, though it may not be meant with any malice, the good bishop doesn't really take out any time to get to know his grandson or care to know why he feels the way he feels. He only desires to take stuff away and introduce his religious beliefs. So what if you're a vegan? We are eating eggs and pork in this house. I'm gonna tear that iPad away from your hands and replace it with faith. 
church maintenance, volunteer work, handing out flyers to attract the community and attending every single church service. Now, Widow Bishop is a respected pillar to most in the community, constantly quoting scripture, always trying to recruit new members, believing that everyone who's anyone should be attending church, but it's also salty into a fault as if he is overcompensating for something. The way that he blatantly ignores a few of the positive things that are in the community. Yeah, if it's not about church, my grandson can't attend. In the good bishop's mind, he is ministering and saving people one soul at a time assuming that his soul is saved as well. Now with Flick tasked to work in the church all summer, the only beacon of fun and hope that he finds is in a friend named Chaz, a young girl who's the same age and the daughter of a church trustee. She's curious, she's fun, she's asthmatic, and she likes Flick right off the back. Now, neither one of these damn children could act like, Ooh, I'm sorry, but no, hell no. <laughs> now Spike Lee going so hard for authenticity and I'm sure trying to keep this film under a certain budget. We didn't go off and try to scout any real child actors. That's why we have the likes of Clark Peters here in a scene interacting with two kids who just attend Spike Lee's junior high. Like, when I tell you it was such a chore to get through the scenes with these two kids, a lot of things here are from Flick's perspective, his feelings, his thoughts, and his ability to convey certain things really needs to push the narrative forward, especially with the pacing issues here in this movie being dry as hell. Like, I feel like in the first hour, nothing happened. I understand what uh, Spike was trying to do and set up his characters, especially the good bishop in a certain light, but it was borderline boring. It was as if he felt like for us to get to that big reveal of the bishop, we had to spend an hour and some change with the bishop punching us in the face repeatedly with religion. Not only that, but nobody here acts like a real person. Their interactions, just something feels off about them. Like it was very nan, nanny, boo boo. I was like, aren't they 13? Like, <laughs> I understood what they were going for, but for the age that they were, a lot of the dialogue that they shared in their uh, interactive play, it came off as if they were all of six years old. But then we would flip it with them on the religious tip and then have all of these intellectual conversations. Whether it was Chaz, who is really, really into her faith with her mother being, you know, blessed and highly favored, that church trustee, she, you know, has on that good old Sunday service dress, a little white dress, <laughs> very much so, uh, you know, a Sunday school baby. So she has, you know, faith, a relationship with God. It is very much so intact. So the fact that she meets Flick and it is none of that, she just really doesn't understand. And we kind of have the same thing going on with the good bishop. So for majority of the movie, it just feels like somebody who is shrouded in you know religious a, a Baptist person having a conversation with an atheist plenty of back and forth with Flick questioning everything why would I believe in a higher being or God look at this look outside this window what exactly do we have with the character of Flick I feel like a lot of his conflict in that loss of religion was really based in the loss of his father. Even though the movie didn't really dig that deep into that, if there was a God and he's, you know, supposed to be this great being, why is he allowing certain things to happen? Why is my dad no longer here? Clearly the death of Flick's father has caused him to retrieve a boast in that attitude, his religious beliefs, and also hiding behind the likes of that iPad. The iPad was supposed to represent a mass, a safe place, a shield, to just like the church was supposed to represent that for the bishop. However, the writing, the execution and pacing was just so poor that I really didn't bother to care. There is constant pushback from Flicks. This is why I don't believe versus his grandfather who is pretty much forcefully trying to make him believe. But that is only gonna take us as an audience so far. About 35% of all of Spike's scripts is just sprinkling knowledge throughout. Like this is just stuff that I want y'all to talk about in here. <laughs> 
the fact that he managed to sprinkle himself into the script as you know Mookie walking around in Red Hook delivering those stamps trying to get paid hey Mook trying to get paid you mean to tell me you've been delivering sales pizzas since 1989 like absolutely not <laughs> if you ever needed confirmation that Mookie was a fuck boy all along it's here we still delivering pizzas now of course it was supposed to be special because this was the first time that Spike had even been a character in one of his movies since 1999 but it really doesn't do anything then we have the likes of Miss Nola darling rolling up with her watchtower not miss my body my mind the only reason I'm consenting to this is because I wish to clear my name people call me a freak rolling up now as a Jehovah Witness Nola darling would never like <laughs> All those things really didn't do anything for me. But like with a lot of Spike Lee's movies, we take these characters to try to sprinkle in some messages. Hey, we have Miss Nola Darling here along with the church trustee. Both of their kids have died and suffered from AIDS. Hey, our character of Chaz is suffering from asthma because of the air pollution that is heavy in the Red Hook projects, along with the asthma medication being really, really expensive. Tying it in back to the church, this neighborhood is starting to heavily suffer from gentrification. They are trying to push us out which is why we are going to have multiple scenes of Chaz and Flick going to the same cement spot in front of this white woman's house to write their names in it. It's a statement that says we're still here you can't wash us away and get rid of us. Very on the nose, very messagey and not in a good way. And then we waste Nate Parker and Thomas Jefferson Bird. R.I.P. to him. Like let's start with Nate Parker. I'm not even going to speak on the Nate Parker issue and why we don't see him anymore as an actor. But when I tell you, like, I love him so much as an actor, I thought he was phenomenal. The first time I really noticed him was in The Great Debaters. I remember watching that and going, who the hell is this? Not even on the attraction tip. The love that I have for movies and actors who can really act, I was like, where is today's generation? You know, our Will Smiths, our Denzel Washingtons, our, you know, Daryl Lindos and Lawrence Fishburns, like these uh, men are getting up in age. Where are the newcomers? It was him, it was Chaswick Bozeman, freaking Jonathan Majors and Lakeith. I was like, we got, we got some. <laughs> We got some. He was just such a delight to me. And seeing him here just brought back memories of what could have been. But he portrays the character of Box Here, your local neighborhood gangbanger. Who the Good Bishop is trying to intensely get to return to church after the passing of his mother and him once being heavy in the church of Little Heaven. But Box uh, respectfully wants the bishop to get the hell out of his face. <laughs> He's not trying to hear any of that. He was also supposed to be an outlet. Just like Flick asked to say, why am I coming to church? Why would I believe in God or any type of religion? Look at this neighborhood, look at my circumstances and limitations. I would much rather stand bold on this block, intimidate and sell drugs. And then we have Deacon Z, one of the few who, though he may be a drunk, <laughs> he keeps it real about the outlook that they should have at Little Heaven. We can barely keep the doors open here. The funds are low, gentrification is rolling through, and there are rarely any bills being paid. However, we always have the good bishop constantly saying, you know, I have faith. Not only will we get out of debt and keep these doors open and get some butts in these seats, but somebody, some, you know, man, some mysterious figure is gonna come through and save this church with life altering news and a life altering donation. Yeah, somebody came all right. But Deacon Z is clearly a reincarnation of the character the mayor constantly dropping science and knowledge even though he is drunk and it sounds like he is spewing out gibberish going out of his way to not only inform people but also taking the blunt of the blame for the kids when they get caught with the snacks very much so the mayor type of behavior and lastly we have sister sharon Chaz's mother, the church trustee, who clearly wishes that she could rub her breast and her kneecaps on the good bishop. Yeah. Waiting on the bishop to finally get the hint 
and maybe marry her, ask her out, do something outside of just preaching. But in her mind, he is being held back at the fact that he is a widow. Maybe he is still mourning, not knowing that it was something completely different that made him stray away from her. But she does contribute some really great acting and some of the best scenes in this movie, like there are a few in Far Between Child, but there is a scene with her and the bishop sitting on the sofa and she is trying to explain why her grips on her youngest daughter is so strong, all that she's lost, why she is trying to get with the times and the generation and parent differently. Meanwhile, we have somebody like the bishop who is stuck in the past, stuck in his ways and doesn't want to do anything outside of what he's currently doing to try to get to know his grandson. He doesn't just need you to be his pastor. He needs you to be his grandfather, his family, and a friend. Bishop just can't seem to get there. Now, after some pranks between the kids, a really great sentimental moment with Chaz's character saying she wants more, you know, you live in Atlanta. I would love to just get away from here, go anywhere. Really, you know, really great identifiable stuff, but the acting is bad and after, oh, I'm a tail, like after that shit, like I don't want these kids in my face at all. But filling seats and saving souls while at the same time being judgmental of his grandson and even his own deacon who likes to drink all the time. As Sister Sharon said to him on that sofa, either change with the times or you are gonna get left behind. He desires to get left behind. He doesn't wanna be seen. He is very stubborn, honorary, and righteous in his beliefs. According to the bishop, everybody else is wrong. However, after so many church services, after spending enough time with his grandfather, his grandson is slowly starting to fall into place taking light and lessons from some of the things he has to say, some of the monologue that we get from Chaz on that bridge, starting to enjoy the services, enjoy the songs, clap along. Somebody in here needs to be saved, but somebody in there has been sitting in the back of the services for weeks now, not saying a word and just watching. I love the moment that we have the bishop walking around the church searching for a soul that needs to be saved and somebody is right here somebody's just like when he gets to blessing sitting in the back he literally goes like uh somebody else needs to be saved. <laughs> like he felt the energy coming off of him because of course at that point he still didn't know who he was now after we finally zoomed in on the character i was like oh shit, that's coleman domingo <laughs> It's a very, very young Coleman Domingo singing the Lord's praises, being judgmental all while giving these sermons, noticing and speaking on the things that are in the neighborhood that, you know, aren't befitting, that, you know, it's lacking. These things aren't right. You know, all these things that need correction outside of his own self. Now, was there some truth in a lot of the statements that the bishop made here? Absolutely. But right message in the wrong messenger. How dare you think you have the capacity or the audacity to say anything to anyone. Blessing finally decides to stand up. Such a great scene. Like with how insufferable this entire movie was, it was almost worth it just for this scene. Like the movie completely shifted. With all of the excitement on the good bishop's face, like finally, this is the prophecy that I have been discussing the entirety of the movie. Absolutely not. <laughs> he literally stands up and says that you did such and such to me, can't say it on this platform, <laughs> when I was 12 years old. You use the Bible, you use religion, you use certain passages and conflicted them to make me think that it was okay for you to do those things for me. You broke my religion, you broke my faith, you broke my relationship with God. I have been looking for you for 13 years. Like, Coleman Domingo, Col Domingo was good. <laughs> like, <laughs> once again, another one of those actors who can really, really act. The way that he conveyed those biblical scriptures that he used to instill in him as a child, just so sick and just so perverse. And not only that, but this is what God wants. It's in the Bible. Like. I was so surprised. <laughs> I was so surprised, which is why I understood the tone and the pacing that Spike was going for, but it was like, we still needed to work on that. It could have been better and we still could have got the same scene. And it still would have been like hella, hella impactful in a world of Bishop Eddie Longs and you know, certain things that happen in Catholic churches with children and priests. Like 
this is such a real situation that they decide to usher in literally with 15 minutes left in the movie and it's just like what this is not enough time to flesh out this the way that it needs to be because situations like this do deserve a voice when i come in here and bear everything my honest truth i'm thrown out nobody believes me i'm literally thrown out of the church with members, usher boards, and deacons, no matter what, still choosing to put religion in this man on a pedestal, even though he did this to me. Once again, speaking to those bouts with religion and faith, what really is it if the likes of a good bishop can use them for his own sick benefit? But after that, you know, sad ass excuse of an asthma attack from Chaz, like, girl, get up. <laughs> I'm sorry, like the acting from those damn kids. We do have the grandfather having no choice but to finally take his mask off. He has literally been in hiding this entire time. We find out that his church in Atlanta figured out exactly what he was doing to Little Blessing, paid off Little Blessing's family, and also paid and gave him a round trip ticket to go off, disappear, and live his best life. He gave a portion of that money, most of that money, to his daughter, and she bought a house in Atlanta and hasn't really low-key spoken to her father ever since. <sighs> I ain't even gotta speak on the church doing what they did. Like, y'all already know what it is. The scene with a uh, little blessing, like it was so heartbreaking. It, it goes to show that, you know, like say less, we didn't need to see any, you know, go test situations happen. We didn't need to hear anything, but just to see him excuse the behavior when he is explaining it to his grandson, of course, at that moment, being honest with himself for who knows how long, saying that yes this did happen but you know i'm fixed like what i wanted him to go into depth and explain to us how he was cured and how he was fixed because if you were so fixed then why the hell are you lying like you have a whole brand new fucking identity um <laughs> but just to see him try to bribe this 12 year old have him you know read those scriptures from like it was just it, it was so sick it just shrouded all of the a lore that was around this holier than thou figure. Like your whole persona is false. It was as if he was now using this fake persona along with this religion to make up for what he did. You cannot go back. You are not fixed. You are ruined. You are sick. Like just, uh, it just really heavily uh, made me beg the question of why did she send him there again? I feel like the mother sent him there to have a better understanding of who she is, why she may be the way she is, but did you really even have any clue that that conversation would come up? The good bishop had no intentions of telling anybody that, let alone his grandson, but just maybe trying to get her son to drop his mask and you know who he has became since his father's passing and get that iPad out of his face but there was just so much more of a conversation that needed to be had as to why even though she clearly couldn't be there and didn't want to go there she sent her son there believing that it would do something for him of course in the end it did but how would you know that it would and how would you know that your own son would be safe and yet again this may be her way of coping and keeping up this facade of what she wants her father to be and who he actually is which is why we you know took that money built our new life and really didn't say anything about it you know oh give and take with your grandpa girl what are you talking about get me the hell out of here it really made me think of those church members or those family members who may have you know that uncle that brother, that aunt, but we continue to allow our kids, cousins, aunties, and sisters to go around this particular individual in the family or in the church, even though we know, hey, way back when, this person did this to this person. Like, now rightfully so, the bishop gets a well-deserved ass whooping. <laughs> he gets beat up. Nate Parker box rolled up with them hands. I really enjoyed that scene. Like I was like, yes, this is what we needed Nate for. Like Spike, don't be over here wasting these good old actors. Like the delivery of those lines were executed so well. You know, this is why my mother, you know, never really trusted you. Everybody in the community could low key see that there was something off about you. We just really didn't know what it was. And now we find out that it's this. Clearly the word in the church has spread around the neighborhood and we do have people who 
are still choosing to believe that it is a flat out lie. You are still the good bishop. Why are these people trying to, you know, throw dirt on your name? It's going to be okay. We are still going to stick by your side no matter what. And then you have the other side that is just like, you are wrong. I rightfully believe that you did this to this man. Like it's completely undeniable. You should be ashamed of yourself. You should be thrown out of this community. But I love that even in the end, amidst the ass whooping, it is still rolling over into the idea that religion can go both ways even though he used religion in such a sick way it still saved his ass in the end for somebody like box who clearly wanted to take him out practice restraint and not do so to honor the lord as well as the relationship that he and his mother had with him yes i'm gonna crucify you here but i'm only gonna take it so far Really, really great scene. I love the direction of him walking all the way back to the apartment building. Like, it just started to get good out of nowhere. I was like, Spike, we got like five minutes left in the movie, sit down. But in the end, we sort of have the favor returned, I guess, with the bishop deciding not to press charges on Box or identify him in a lineup along with his grandson. I was like, why is she here, Ike? <laughs> Why is she here? We got all the way here just so we could say she. Like, oh, 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 like, <laughs> I just didn't know what the movie was trying to say about the good bishop and how they wanted us as an audience to look at him because we have been looking at him through the perspective of his grandson. He wasn't disturbed. He was just kind of ingesting everything around him. As to say, I now have a better understanding of you, beliefs, religion, and you in turn have helped me with the relationship that I have with my mother, uh, my missing father, and you know, the conflict there. And we just go home. I was like, what? Like, <laughs> it just felt so freaking incomplete. Now we know that he is changed because um Chaz has been holding on to this cross from her sister who has passed away you know that she holds near and dear to her heart I thought you liked me you 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 don't like me I was like what are y'all fucking 13 or what like oh god um <laughs> she gives him the cross and he gives her the ipad as to say you know what i really don't need this anymore and i will also take you know some of this religion and a lot of the things that i have learned here with me all the way back home to atlanta i'm not returning home the way that i came but and of course the um driver is speaking on the bishop saying what he doesn't believe and you know you're still the good bishop to me as a lot of the people in the community they will always see him as the good bishop and somebody just tried to sully his name like <sighs> but that's just it just felt so incomplete and not in a way of those ambiguous you know jungle fever school days type of endings where you feel that it's profound and you love it i was just left feeling like, so empty here and was like where is the other five minutes of the movie of him walking into his house in atlanta and his mama having a conversation like i just knew we were going to end off on that but they didn't give us that we end off on a collection of photos and videos that he has taken during his summer in red hook <sighs> please drop down in those comments and talk to me y'all love rolling up to a video being quiet i don't need y'all to be quiet this time <laughs> i need to hear all kinds of theories and thoughts please 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 help me out well you guys that was my review for red hook summer i hope you enjoyed it please drop down and tell me if you did like give, give me your thoughts <laughs> give me your thoughts i cannot wait to read them remember to like share and subscribe because it helps me out so much you guys i am trying to get to 25k before this year is out that would be great you know i really desire 30 but youtube stay playing in my face they they they, they really do <laughs> but it's okay we are gonna always keep going and do what we can i appreciate you guys so much for watching this video i see you next time bye